There is so much going on out there right now. And Bishop Frank is going to spend today talking about some current events, including the leaked Supreme Court opinion on Roe v. Wade, vocations, and a new survey report issued by Kara from Georgetown, and some news about Pope Francis, and more. It's a great show we have ahead, so keep your radio right here at 1350 AM and 103.9 FM, or keep us on your phone using the Veritas mobile app. The mobile app is available at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, and VeritasCatholic.com. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them online at foundationsinfaith.org. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, my name is Steve Lee, and I'm very pleased and honored to introduce, as always, Bishop Frank Caggiano. First of all, it's good to see you. We have Great a lot to, see to talk about, my goodness. Holy smoke. What a week. There's I mean, so much uh, going on. Truly. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, yes. So, I, I have a long list of stuff, but uh, mm-hmm. we'll just see what we get to. I guess... Yep. I guess if we could just jump into it, you know, the, the biggest news presently right now is, of course, the leaking of the uh, Supreme Court opinion on Dobbs v. Jackson. Mm-hmm. And... Um, mm-hmm. Which is extraordinarily regrettable. Regrettable for many reasons. And quite frankly, to, to my understanding, inscrutable as to what gain there was to do this. You know, because if you are a conservative and want to leak this, to pressure the justices to stay in line, then you're only creating a societal reaction that could actually cause them to waver. Mm -hmm. And if you're a liberal, why would you want it issued in advance so that the impact of what you would want to protest should be as close to the election as possible if you want to? So it's mysterious to me. But it is a grave misjustice in general to the authority of the Supreme Court, regardless of what anybody says. No one should be happy that that was done. Yeah. At least in my opinion. Now, having said that, having said that, I think it is, at least as an initial opinion, which could theoretically change before it's issued, it is very encouraging from from a, a believer's point of view that the idea that Roe versus Wade, Wade, creates a constitutional right for the, pro- the procurement of abortion, that that be eliminated, I think, is a huge step forward in the pro-life movement. It will not eliminate abortion, and that's clearly what we have to understand, right? Because if I remember correctly, Roe versus Wade, it's actually, it allowed abortion nationwide as a right to approximately 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy, if I'm not mistaken, okay? But that doesn't preclude a, a, a state to do that. The little I read about the opinion, it says this is a legislative decision. This is a legislative matter, not a judicial matter. And therefore, the legislature, whether it is the Congress or states, need to, to, to weigh in on basic questions like what is the meaning of life? When is what life begin? Is there a right to privacy in this case, right? Is it a reproductive um, health care choice or is it a much more fundamental life choice? Now, the church is very clear on all those things, very clear of what we believe. It is both in the natural law and in revelation, so it's very clear. Human life from the moment of conception has inherent dignity, is sacred, it reflects the image and likeness of God and must be protected, period. Okay. But states could choose to do otherwise, and I think there's a whole number that have already codified. So I think it is, in a sense, uh, a step forward, but it also opens up many battlegrounds now. There are many places now that this is going to be debated. 
and they will not all be victorious for pro-life, right? So that's, that's part of the difficulty of what we have now. Um, and I think it will put enormous pressure on politicians to alter the way Congress works so that a federal statute could be passed before the midterm elections. Yeah. Where conceivably the numbers of those who would advocate that sort of action could diminish in the midterm elections. Right. So it's a, it's a very precarious moment. It's a hopeful and encouraging moment. But it's also something that, it's a moment where we have to recognize that those who wish to protect unborn life, that, that uh, the work, our work, that work is not finished by any stretch of the imagination. Not at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Uh, um, right. Just, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. I only know what I, what I read about. But uh, mm-hmm. the idea that I see from lawyers is that you know, Justice Alito has systematically kind of just gone through the constitutionality of the law and, mm-hmm. and taken it apart. But, yeah, exactly. Um, somebody asked me this week, oh, so uh, now that means that um, there'll be no more March for Life and um, oh, something no, else they, they mentioned. But I said, no, yeah, because the, the, as you said, the struggle continues. Be. Sure. Absolutely. New Jersey just codified abortion in its constitution. In the state of Connecticut, there's both a, a, a bill as well as um, a, a proposed amendment to the state constitution, right, that wants to codify the right of abortion. So no, no, not at all. Not at all. See, in the end, it's the nationwide uh, judicial decision that there's a constitutional right to abortion that prevents states from weighing in legislatively on the question is what's gone. And that is major progress. 26 states would have laws that would restrict abortion or outlaw abortion simply if this, if this opinion, if this ruling were to become the law, right? That's progress. Yeah. But also you have to consider the majority of the population of the United States lives in states where it would be codified or where it could quickly be codified. And that's where the struggle has to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like as you as you mentioned here right now, the Connecticut Senate is uh, debating two laws. One of them, I believe, um, allows for non-doctors, nurses, nurse midwives to perform abortions. Mm hmm. And then the other one would effectively allow abortion through all nine months of the pregnancy. Right, which is essentially what the law is now. Right? Yeah, right. But With that's, partial, birth, partial birth abortion. Right, exactly. That's which is horrifying. You can have, of course it is. And that's, that, that, is, that is what is practiced. And yeah, exactly, without a doubt. And, and on the state levels... That is a much tougher fight because the states that have advocated abortion for a very long time um, have majority, um, the majority of the peoples in those states usually uh, support the abortion rights as they're codified in law. So we would have to change the public perception and opinion before the legislators change their opinion. So there's a lot of work to be done. Now, it would be major progress because the states already at that point would have the freedom to say abortion needs to to be curtailed or in the ideal abortion would need to be eliminated, right? But for a lot of states, including Connecticut, there's a lot of work to be done to change people's perceptions and thinking and hearts on the matter because the legislators are only going to reflect what their constituents want, right? Yeah. Yeah, it starts with the hearts. Without a doubt. Yeah. I've said this before. I mean, all of the legislative and judicial work that's being done really set up guardrails of how people should behave. Right? So if the law prohibits it, you are not to do it. In abortion, we know that in history, if the law prohibits it, there are ways to find the service even outside the law. So, for example, these mail-order pills now that mm-hmm. induce abortion, how would they be regulated even in the states that prevent 
now abortion if this were to become the uh, the law? Right. That's a very good question. Yeah. And I, I have absolutely no idea how to answer that question. So to your point, if a heart, if the heart of a person is in on procuring this, then in effect, the guardrails will not always successfully prevent that from happening. The only thing that's 100% guaranteed to prevent an abortion from happening is the conviction of the person making that decision that they will not do it. <laughs> yes. Yep. So the real battle is the conversion of people's hearts, yeah. which would then demand a change in people's behavior. So, uh, in in your opinion, Excellency, because the science, as science and techno medical technology continue to get better, we get to see mm -hmm. more and learn more about, say, like fetal development, things like mm -hmm. that. We see that mm -hmm. it is, you know, it's it's increasingly difficult to uh, dismiss it as not a baby. Mm -hmm. How? Is, is that the best approach, you think, when we're talking to people, the science of it, or? It's a very complicated question. Yeah. Because I think the science is an essential piece of it, but it's not the only piece for it. It's also a question of um, how do you define personal rights? And how do you define one's liberty? How do you define the common good? Because in the end, if it is perceived now, it's interpreted as a right, correct? It's interpreted as a right. It's a constitutional right. And therefore, if it is a constitutional right in the federal constitution, then um, I can do it if I wish, and I don't have to if I don't want to. But in the end, um, who decides, or from a better, better way of putting it, from what point, from, from what starting point do I decide how I exercise my rights? So, if I do not have a belief in an ultimate lawgiver who is God, to whom I am accountable, who prescribes for me um, the boundaries, the divine guardrails in which I should behave, if they, that is not present in my consciousness, in, my, in, in the way I see life, the what I believe, if that is true, then what would prevent me from exercising my right solely because it's my opinion, my preference, my suggestion, the only alternative I see is viable in any given situation? And all those are different because the question of abortion is very, very complicated because of the extenuating circumstances a woman may find herself in, right? So if the church always approaches the situation with compassion, you have to. It's the, it's the demand of the gospel. But ultimately, in a society that's become secular, that has no place for a God who has absolute truth, then this question becomes very complicated. Because then you revert back to the common good. And one would say, well, how does it offend the common good if I were to do this? Because it's my business. What does that have to do with you? So you, 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 you descend into a world of just individual islands with individual rights and just kind of like don't tread on me, which is very American from the American Revolution. So it's one of the flashpoints of the secular culture fighting, right, confronting, battling what we would want to be a Christian response or a Christian stance of life. Yeah. That's why it raises so much passion. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, I, I guess before we move on from this topic, um, there's, uh, there's probably someone or a woman uh, listening who may have had an abortion or taken part in mm -hmm. some way and she might be struggling right now or mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. feeling guilt or I don't know mm -hmm. I mean, what would you what would you like to say to to that person first thing clearly is that the, the Lord loves you 
and the church loves you, even if you've made this decision, which we believe was gravely sinful. But, but we want you to come and sit and talk with the priest and take that burden off of your conscience and move on with life, all right? And please, God, if you have come to a reckoning that what you did was a terrible mistake, then you have an opportunity to restart your life in grace, right? There's no sin that is unforgivable except the sin against the Holy Spirit, which is the sin not seeking forgiveness at all. So I, I think if, if there's any woman who's listening to this who has procured an abortion and now is deeply troubled and, and, and not reconciled with what happened and, or regretful for what happened, then the church loves you. The church wants you to come home right? yeah. and to take that burden off of you. Right? Yeah. And Jesus we can is the great healer. Without a doubt, without a doubt. So I, I think in the end, um, what's happening now with the uh, this Supreme Court ruling on Dobbs, I do think that everybody has to take a step back and everyone has to take a deep breath. And for those who believe in the sanctity of life, we need to thank the Lord that we've made significant progress, but we cannot step back from the noble and divine mission to help people to understand why we believe what we believe. And in that process, hopefully convert more and more people's hearts to the beauty and value of unborn life. and not give up the struggle to do that. Because we, the victory will be won. Now listen to this, this may sound really out there, but a true victory against the culture of death will be won when whether there is a law permitting abortion or not, that no one would procure one. Amen. That's the ultimate victory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think I'd like to switch to another another topic. Um, mm -hmm. This was uh, this was something I didn't even know this existed, but I guess just recently we had uh, World Day of Prayer for Vocations. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's an annual event, right? And That's we also cool. have Good Shepherd Sunday. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, we need the <laughs> prayers, without a doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I saw in, uh, in the Holy Father's statement on the day, um, I just read it mm -hmm. quickly, and there was one quote that I just thought was so beautiful. Do you mind if I just read it quickly, Excellency? No, please, please, please. Each man and woman, even before encountering Christ and embracing the Christian faith, receives with the gift of life a fundamental calling— each of us is a creature willed and loved by God. Each of us has a unique and special place in the mind of God. God's loving gaze always meets us, touches us, sets us free, and transforms us, making us into new persons. That is what happens in every vocation. We are met by the gaze of God who calls us. Mm, beautiful. That's the universal call of holiness. God has a plan for everyone. Yeah, and all and, and all those states of life in the church are beautiful. Right? Starting with married life, which is the covenant of love. Remember Christopher West when he was on our podcast, the beautiful yes. exposition he gave, right? And the yeah. event that followed, right at St. Yeah. Mary's in Richmond, yeah, exactly, it's tremendous. Yes, right. But in this case, when we, we speak of a call to the permanent state of life, that um, enters into ministerial priesthood, when a man is called to ministerial priesthood, then that is a unique vocation that has unique blessings and unique challenges that more and more individuals I see are being called to older in life, hmm. not necessarily younger in life. But it's absolutely essential 
because if there is no ministerial priesthood, there is no Eucharist. Yeah. If there is no Eucharist, there would not be a foundation for the church that could last. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you saw, Excellency, but um, CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, based out of Georgetown, they did this year's um, survey of seminarians. And um, I just took a quick look at some of the highlights and mm -hmm. I'm just going to read some of them to you and just see if you have thoughts or if you don't, we can move on to the next one. But this is uh, a, just like you said, Excellency, finding their vocations later. 68% of seminarians surveyed this year said that they had full-time work experience before entering the seminary. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I like – so just some of the, the basics – 75% were uh, or being ordained in a diocese, 25% in, um, in a religious order. And on average, seminarians said that they first considered the priesthood when they were 16 years old. Let's just stop there for a second. Okay. Let's just stop. It, it, rather than just go through the statistics, yes. let's ask the question, what's really going on here? You see, there is a fundamental shift here. Um, I would think in my generation, the thought of considering priesthood occurred at a much earlier age than 16. Really? Like, I remember it. Oh, yeah, sure. I remember it when I was a little boy, fascinated with it. Hmm. I remember in grammar school, at 16, you're what? A sophomore in high school? Junior in high school? Sophomore, yeah, junior sophomore, in high school. junior, yeah. Right. So you're, you're post puberty in the midst of all the stuff that trying to figure out how to how to fit in life, priest to come. It is fundamentally a different dynamic than when you're eight or nine or ten and kind of fascinated mm. with the priestly life. And one of the questions I would love to 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 debate, figure out is what has shifted that allows it to occur later which I thank God it occurs, it occurs mm -hmm. later. And what are we missing at the beginning of primary school that doesn't raise the question earlier? And I don't know what the data is on that or what the explanation is, but my guess is some of that is family life. Hmm. Because 16, you're already beginning to look towards an independent life. Yeah. So in my mind, it calls into question... Um, what's the role in the contemporary church that families see in recognizing, identifying, and supporting vocations within the church itself? All right. So remember that statistic: you're eighteen, you're sixteen years of age, give or take, when you first ask. Mm -hmm. Eighteen years later is when they're ordained. Yeah. And the average age is 36 in 1999, 33, so it's gone a little bit younger. But 33 is different from 26. Yes. If you went through the system. So it's seven years later. And that goes to your point about the seven years being time for work, being out into the world. So what does the church do to support men who are working and discerning? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I had uh, uh, two other things just quickly jumped out at me. One was that 74% mm -hmm. um, uh, said that they participated in regular Eucharistic adoration before entering the seminary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. that just makes sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it does. And 72 prayed the rosary. 72% prayed the right. rosary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So you've already opened yourself up to, to listen to what the master wants. Correct. Right. Then, but there are other... Th I'm sorry. No, please. No, there are other things too that are interesting in the, in the report. I'm not sure if we have time before the break. We could return to this as well because it is very important. But... Um, we still, the majority of seminarians in the United States are, I'm going to say, of European descent, or Caucasian of European descent.
but that does not reflect the ethnic composition of the American church. Right. Right. Which is quickly becoming far more Hispanic. Right. So only a, a fifth of, of seminarians now in seminary to be ordained, only a fifth are Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And that's an area that the church needs to work on. Yeah. Is to attract Hispanic men to the priesthood, to discern a call to the priesthood, and culturally to help people to understand the value where in some cultures, um, passing on the family name, like it is true even when I was there, when I was young, um, or to see your son advance in prosperity and social status, that all buttresses against uh, a vocation of service and celibacy in the ministerial priesthood. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let's. I, so I have one more, but we'll do it after the break. This is Let Me Be Frank okay. on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, we will be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. So His Excellency is talking about, uh, presently he's talking about the uh, CARA report out of Georgetown um, survey of seminarians for this year. So Excellency, I have... One other thing that really jumped out, and it's because um, you say it all the time. And so mm -hmm. here, 90% of the seminarians surveyed this year said they, they report being encouraged to consider the priesthood by someone in their life. Most frequency, right. frequently, the parish priest, a friend, or another parishioner. That's what you always say. If you see something, right. say something. Right, because 48% of them were discouraged from going into the vocation of the priesthood. Yeah. And it could very well be by the same people, parents, classmates, friends. Mm hmm Exactly. So you got to level the playing field for half of our future priests, if nothing else. Yeah. Right. And we can't underestimate that. But there's an a couple of other things, too. Mm-hmm. We've said this before, we've just talked about this before. In the United States, the Catholic Church would be diminishing by a quarter if it was not for the influx of immigrants into the United States, most of whom are Hispanic. Yeah. Right? The same is true in the men to be born. A quarter of them are foreign born. It mirrors exactly the same trend. Hmm. And there seems to be, in some circles, a reluctance to welcome men who are foreign-born because they need to acculturate, because of language, because of accents, and all the rest. But the point I want to make to everyone is, if it wasn't for, this, for the tremendous generosity of these young men who are being ordained, and the men who are foreign-born already in the ranks of the priesthood, we would be in a far worse place. 
to attend to the needs of God's people. So we should be grateful that they're coming from Mexico, Vietnam, Brazil, Colombia, India, and so many other places. Yes, right? definitely. Yep. There's one other thing, too, that I want to point out, which I think is quite startling to me, at least. In education, about 42% of all the future ordinandi attended Catholic school. Yeah. Which means 65, 60-ish percent attended only parish religious education. <coughs> I'm guessing that that is an upheaval from 30 years ago. <coughs> I would guess 30 years ago, 80, 85, 90% of all those in seminary attended Catholic school. And part of the reason it's dropped is because the number of schools have dropped. <coughs> the number of, of, of young people who attend Catholic schools has also dropped, right, Nation, nationwide in the last 20, 30 years. But the fact that the majority come from uh, involvement in parish religious education program, this is my question. What part of religious education formation highlights vocations, vocational discernment, and most especially ministerial priesthood? Having looked at this report now, this is a question I need to bring to all of our parishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the presumption was always that this, if the vocations come, they'll come from a majority will come from our Catholic schools, but that's not the case. Right. Yeah. Which I find absolutely fascinating. Yes. Right. Again, a shift that you don't you 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 would not perceive unless you take a step back and have someone independently look and then report back the results and say, okay, so now how do you? How do you respond How do you, to the changing landscape? Mm -hmm. And then implementing that in CCD programs could also help bring that age that young men first consider back down from 16 to 8 or 9. Right. And of course, at 8 or 9, you can't make a decision to become a priest. That's not the point. <laughs> right. But what it is, is it, 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 it activates the religious imagination so that it sits there all right, as a thought that's considered and prayed over and reflected that could be decided upon in your 20s. But it's there, and that's what's essential. Yeah. Just like any other good, like the vocation to be married or other beautiful vocations, they're all there, equally there, so a person can reflect on them as they grow older. That's my concern. Not that yeah. an eight, nine-year-old certainly has to make a decision. <laughs> Goodness. You yeah. know... <laughs> So this is so we had a, a listener who um, listened to the live show that broadcasted a few weeks ago, and in it, you told the story of your ordination, and when you walked out of the church, you saw one of your Jesuit teachers from Regis who was there and was so happy for you and so proud of you, and the thing that he mm -hmm. said was, this would have been perfect if you had become a Jesuit. <laughs> So, yes. Oh, yeah. Father Kelly. Yep. Yes. So this listener heard that and she said, my question to you, Bishop Frank, is what are the different types of priests, Jesuits, Franciscans, friars, monks, and others I don't know, and how did you or how should any priest choose? Well, it's a great question. Right, because when we talk about vocations in priesthood, there's vocation to diocesan priesthood and vocation to religious life, that which could be both priesthood for a man or a brother, right? So as a lay member, the truth of the matter is, and let me talk about myself first. My, I always had a great affinity with my home parish, and I saw my home parish as like a family. And that deeply attracted me to ministry as a diocesan priest. Because family is extraordinarily important to me. And absent a natural family that is my own, if I were married, that ecclesial family is extremely important to me. Now, religious communities founded by, many of them founded by uh, men and women, 
who are saints, recognized as saints, mm -hmm. they create a community around the charism. And around that charism, the community grows. Mm -hmm. And they consecrate themselves to be leaven in the world, in part to realize the charism. And many times in those communities, there's a branch that becomes consecrated and a branch that can be also priests, ordained priests. So the difference is, in religious life, you are, you are a member of a community who share the same vocation. And you are attracted to the charisms of, or charism of the founder to live your life according to that charism and to be its missionary in the world, to affect it, that charism in the world. A diocesan priest is really at the service of God's people, right, in these local parishes, which I kind of liken to be local families of faith. So one, it's the community that's your family. The other, it, the community of faithful. The other is the community of the, of the religious themselves, that is your community. And therefore, there are different charisms, and then there are different, you know, religious congregations, Jesuits, Franciscans, and all the rest. And each have a different charism. Right. Like education, or serving the poor, or missionary sure. work. Or like yeah. the Dominicans, for example, one of their charisms is preaching. And that's what they do. They preach, particularly the priests. They preach, and they, many of them are superb preachers, and they're very effective. Yeah. Right? And, and so, so that's the difference there. And, and so if you, you don't discern a vocation to religious life in the abstract, because you can't. You discern a religious vocation to the particular community that you may be attracted to. So if you say, I want to be a religious, but what does that mean? Because without the charism, I'm a, that, it doesn't really mean much, but I want to be a Franciscan or a Jesuit or a Dominican or whatever else. That makes sense. So yeah. that's the difference. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at, uh, <laughs> at the risk of, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell a joke. And um, okay. uh, keeping in mind, I'm, and then you'll I'm be banned by the Vatican, yes, excommunicated. Exactly. Keep going. So <laughs> there's a there's a young man who uh, who was trying to discern whether he should become a uh, Jesuit or Dominican, and he said, "What's the difference between the two orders?" And the priest he was talking to said, "Well, the Jesuits were formed to battle against um, the Protestants, and the Dominicans were formed to battle against the Albigensians." And uh, the young man said, huh, so which one's better? Which one should I choose? And the older gentleman said, well, you ever see any Albigensians around anymore? <laughs> so I love the Jesuits. I went to Boston College. I love, I love the Jesuits. Okay, you'll get the hate mail. Remember, yes, Steve yes. said that, not me. Steve Lee, Cara Veritas. <laughs> not me. Oh, gosh. Maybe we should move on. <laughs> so... I, I saw Excellency in the news that um, the, the Holy Father, he is, uh, as his health gets more difficult for him, he still remains very active. And, and now he says mm -hmm. that he would like to meet with Vladimir Putin. Mamma mia, <laughs> really. I think the, the, I think the offer is noble. But that would be like meeting with the wall. Right, right. Right. It'd be like meeting with, because what response, this man, I'm not even thinking he's rational, to be honest. Yeah. But, but the offer is to mediate, really. The offer yes. is to be a, a bridge in that. Right. I mean, if he accepted it, I'd be shocked. Yeah. But to make the offer is courageous. Yes. But I, I honestly don't think it has much hope of getting a response. Right. Yep. Nor would he, right. you know, it, it's more likely, I'm just guessing that Putin would use it as, you know, some form of propaganda on his own side. But I agree. I mean, I love the, the idea, the heart of, of Pope Francis in wanting to do that. Oh, yeah, without doubt. Well, it, it, again, it's, it's his patron, you know, his, the name he chose as the Bishop of Rome is Francis. For him, you know, Francis went to the Sultan. We yes. talked about that. Yes. All right, for the, in the name of peace. So certainly to do that. The difficulty here is that cr the Christian voice in the war is divided. 
And that the Pope has done something about, which unfortunately has been received not as a fraternal encouragement to change, but has been received as an excuse to draw even a greater division with the Latin Church, and that is, I'm referring to the Russian Orthodox Church. Right. And the Patriarch in particular, who has been unabashed in his support of the war. Mm -hmm. And it's reputed that the Pope said to him that you are not making yourself Putin's altar boy. Well, yes. Which is what the Pope said to the Patriarch, right. which was quite a courageous thing to say. I'm sure he did not take well to that at all. Right. And that is why their meeting in June has been canceled. Mm -hmm. But you have to tell the truth. Yes. And the Russian Orthodox Church has had a close relationship with Putin and his, and his government, I think from its inception. And if I remember correctly, when Putin came to power, he gave back many of the concessions the Russian Orthodox Church enjoyed in Russia, kind of reestablishing them. And I would, I would hate to have to conclude that it's a quid pro quo to be able to continue to enjoy that privilege by having to support the war. Yeah. But I honestly don't understand how anyone could possibly justify what's yeah. going on. It just amazes me. Yeah. You know, so Pope Francis said something on Friday, which, again, I was like, wow. Um, and I guess I, I read it in light of, we know that all things work for the good for those who serve the Lord. And the Lord can take any tragedy and turn it into something better than we thought. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Father said, today in the face of the barbarity of war, he talked about a longing for unity among Christians that must be nourished anew. I mean, what can we, dare we even imagine that we might see a reunification of some of the churches? Of the churches? Of course, we pray for that. Um, part of the difficulty of bringing unity to communion, to communion, is um, our belief in the real presence, which is foundational for us. Mm -hmm. Remember, Christians are divided, but they are still united. There isn't a complete break because baptism is validly celebrated in most of the Christian world. So we are Christians. We are all baptized into Christ. So there is a basic, very rudimentary, but extremely basic and important unity among many Christians. Mm -hmm. The division occurs as you go further into initiation into the church, fully f more into the things we believe because you're baptized into Christ, but there has to be a unity of belief for the body to function. So the body has separated because we don't have that unity of belief. Yeah. And the unity of belief comes from both, both understanding the faith and living it, both, both. So uh, among our Protestant sisters and brothers, the vast majority of them, particularly among evangelicals, do not have a belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They believe it's symbolic. Right? We, could, we could start with the Orthodox, minus the Russians, but we could start with the Orthodox. Yeah, and the Orthodox in many ways have kept the deposit of faith similar to what we have held from, from the apostles. And it's the synodal structure of the church that has been a problem for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's governance, not mm -hmm. so much doctrine. There are certain yeah. things that we do, like the filioque and stuff, but most of that I think has been theologically we can work resolved. That out. It's, it's, yeah, it's the theological. And then, of course, it's the theological differences, right, um, when it comes to governance and the role of Peter and the primacy yes. of Peter. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I ask, uh, Excellency, the, uh, Pope Francis has been um, actively uh, restructuring departments in the Vatican. 
Right. And and then so I read last week um, that he was uh, he was merging four foundations into one kind of um, right. hospitality body, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I, I didn't get it. Is it is this just a group? These are groups that welcome priests and bishops to Rome and take care of them while they're there, or? Well, one is uh, Santa Marta, where the Pope lives now, that was built specifically for use in the conclave. So when there's a conclave, the cardinals could be, could be sequestered there. But now others live there. But if there were a conclave, they'd all have to move out. So mm-hmm. others could come into their rooms. And there are other casa, there are other houses of hospitality for priests and religious. So I think what he's doing is simplifying governance. Okay. And putting them all under one jurisdiction. I think right. he's trying to simplify the bureaucracy yeah. of the central administration of the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can't argue with that. No. Um, oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> okay. One last thing that I had on my, uh, on my list of things. God, I, mm-hmm. I can't believe we got through all of them. Um, so, so there's this, uh, the USCCB is initiating this three-year Eucharistic revival. Correct. Yeah, and um, they just announced that they, they, they put together a team of 60 priests to act as preachers to mm-hmm. be kind of the front lines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's exciting. It is. It's, it's one of the many initiatives that's coming out of the National Eucharistic Revival. And again, the point is to help Catholics to rediscover the depth and breadth of what the Church teaches about the Eucharist. And they would be equipped and formed to be able to be at the disposal of a bishop to have a Eucharistic retreat or to reach out to different parishes or the cathedral parish or to come or to do training. And that's extremely important. I mean, 60 priests in 180 some odd dioceses with 75 million Catholics is a start, but it's not a huge start, but it's a start. Yeah. My thinking on that is every priest should be uh, a missionary of the Eucharist, right? I mean, I mean, it's great that they could come, but every priest should be on fire and every priest should be preaching the, the beauty and the mystery. And what are we talking about when we talk about the Eucharist? We've said this hundreds of times. It's, it's uniting in the mystery of grace with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Mm-hmm. He's offering his body and blood and offering such a way that we have to eat and digest it because the whole person is saved, not just our spirit, including our bodies in the resurrection of the dead. Yeah. I mean, it's so fundamental to why there is an incarnation, why there was a crucifixion, why there was a resurrection. It's for the salvation. It's the generous love of the Father to send his beloved Son to be the agent, the bridge of our redemption and salvation. Now, the fundamental problem here is if you don't think you need a Savior, if you don't think you need to be redeemed, if you don't think you are a sinner, then you don't need the Eucharist in your mind. It just becomes an historical remembrance. What historical remembrance? I, I, we're not remembering Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> right? We're talking about the definitive act of salvation. Because I need a Savior, and I am a sinner. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I want to go to heaven. Let's make it clear. Right? <laughs> and I think it's many people who feel the same way I do. But not everyone who calls themselves a Christian, even in our own church, has come to that point. Yeah. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of what we talked about with abortion. In the end, right, abortion is a grave evil. It's an attack on unborn, innocent life that cannot defend itself. So that is, by definition, a sin. It is a grave sin. But if a person does not believe that, then everything we talked about at the beginning is, is fought out in political strategy, judicial strategy, but there's a higher purpose here that, that puts all of that in its proper perspective that is missing in secular society. 
and it's missing because in fact um, there isn't this sense that we we stand before a God greater than us who created us, gave us a sense, a conscience, and gives us natural and divine revelation, but natural law and divine revelation to guide our lives to heaven. It's the bottom line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are you... Are you at liberty to say what might be next in the rollout of the Eucharistic revival, or should we save that for another day? No, I think in the Eucharistic revival, we will, in our diocese, um, as in all the dioceses, the next year will be for training of leaders, parish leaders, clergy, diocesan leaders. And then the following year would be work to revive parishes around the Eucharist. And then they would be ending with a national Eucharistic Congress, yeah. which will be in Indianapolis, I believe in 2024. Yeah. Right. But, but, but as I've said to many people who I've spoken about this, the, the real fundamental question that has to be asked is, how did we get here? How did we get here? That so many Catholics don't have an understanding of the Eucharist. And not just an understanding, but a, a belief in the real presence. How did we get here? And we have to do whatever we have to do to make sure we never get here again, right? Right, yep, yep, yeah. Because it's, there's, a, there's a general lack of belief in anything these days. And again, in my mind, the lack of belief in the Eucharist the lack of belief in the sacredness of human life, all right, they are all symptoms of a deeper disease. And the deeper disease is that many people have successfully created a life that has cut out the sovereign authority of God. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise you that they, they're battling over questions or leaving things behind that are so fundamental because without a God who actually is my savior, not just a benevolent presence somewhere in the cosmos that kind of guides my, but who is my savior and redeemer, who is saving me from, from literally the nothingness that would be my destiny otherwise, that, you, that's, that, is that the disease? And if it's the disease, what are we doing about it? How do you, how do you help people to encounter God yep. in Jesus Christ, who is God? And then everything else changes. Then you don't have to worry about preaching the, a pro-life message or the mystery of the Eucharist. Can See, you imagine? <laughs> and that's where ultimately the church has to finally land. How do you evangelize people to, in real time, encounter God for who he is? And understand and believe with your whole heart how much he loves you. Then everything else can fall into place. Yes. Amen. Let's, uh, let's take one more break, Excellency, and come back on the other side mm -hmm. with a listener question. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network featuring Bishop Frank Caggiano. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Excellency, this is the time of the show where we get to the listener question. So yeah. here's the email. The email said, Dear Steve, Happy Easter to you and Bishop Frank. I have a question Amen. for Bishop Frank. Uh, happy Easter back. Um, here's the question. Why are there so many different reconciliation prayers and are some used for special seasons or masses? Well, that's an interesting question because I'm not exactly sure what the reconciliation prayers are referring to. Um, there are Eucharistic prayers for reconciliation in the Mass. Um, and they are used in the penitential seasons, particularly Lent. And there's more than one. So that could be part of what she, the question may be referring to. Um, 
But there are a variety of reconciliation prayers, such as there's a variety of acts of contrition that have been learned. Um, and that's really for ease of use. In the sacrament of reconciliation and penance, there's only the one prayer of absolution, right, that needs to be used for it to be valid. So I'm not exactly sure what the person's referring to, but in some cases, there's only the one. In other cases, there's a variety, simply because there's a variety of ways to engage people's minds and hearts in seeking reconciliation and having it offered to them. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if we didn't do... If we didn't answer your question fully, please feel free to email again and, and, and ask for more clarification. And if you are out there and you have a question for Bishop Frank, please feel free to send it in to us on social media or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And we would like to thank Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Excellency, thanks for uh, bringing us up to date on some of the stuff that's going on out there this week. Yeah, it's a lot going on. We need to keep praying. Yes. Mm -hmm. And before we go, would you please give us your blessing? In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, shine his face upon you, grant you his mercy, and may he grant you his peace. And may he bless you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Okay, my friend, next week we will see what happens this coming week. Yes. It may be quite eventful. Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week, Excellency. God bless. Bye-bye.